Hi everybody and welcome to another episode of Gaffer and Gear. Today we're going to be looking at the new Nunlight Forza range. So this is the 60, which is a 60 watt light engine, and this is the 300. They also have a 500, which apparently is only a little bit bigger, uh, but the 500 is not ready for anyone to have a look at yet. So these two lights are not the finished product. These are the first factory samples that have been going out to the distributors. So I've been lucky enough to get my hands on these for two days. In fact, uh, tomorrow these are being picked up and they're leaving Melbourne where I live and going to Adelaide for the next person to have a look at. What do I think of these lights? Well, having had a play with these lights for a couple of days, um, I've actually sold my RE Pocket Par 400s. I've actually sold my small HMIs. And here's why. I'm gonna use the 300 as an example. Um, no hot restrike issues, okay? Uh, no inconsistency of globe stock. Dimmable runs off V-Lock batteries, and here's the icing on the cake. This unit's only 300 watts, and it is brighter than a 575 HMI PAR. So when I say it's brighter than a 575 HMI PAR, I'm talking about a 575 HMI PAR with the medium flood lens in it. So my prediction here is the writing is on the wall for small HMI PARs, so watch this video and start thinking about what you're gonna do if you're a gaffer. Okay, I've got a busy schedule this week and I don't have time to, to reshoot or re-edit this video. So here's a few things i found out since filming it. Okay, number one, uh, you can get uh, little Wi-Fi remote controls like uh, TV remotes that will operate these lights. So I was unaware of that at the time that I shot this. Uh, number two, the, uh, the 60, the Forza 60, the small unit, will actually run off a V-Lock battery via a D-Tap adapter. Number three, I completely forgot to mention that the uh, 300s and 500s, the bigger units, will have decent Fresnel mounts available for them. So you can get a Fresnel stick it on the front with decent barn doors. Um, that will come about one month, I believe, after the lights are released, they, they will be released. So you can get decent Fresnels. And the other thing I forgot to mention, I forgot to mention Protog, the distributor in Australia. So a very big thank you to Protog for giving me these lights. Okay, let's have a look at the video. Now, these aren't the first cob lights that I've come across. And, you know, Aperture have had the 300D out for at least two years now. So they're, they're not an uncommon or an unheard of thing. Um, in fact, I actually had uh, cob lights about five or six years ago. I had these big, they would have been about this big, 200 watt LED cob lights. And I don't think the world was ready for them at that stage. A lot of cinematographers couldn't get their head around what I was trying to do with these things. But what super excites me about uh, cob lights isn't you know, the accessories you can mount on the front. What I really, really love is the fact that it's one light source. So basically using it with no reflector, you get incredibly crisp shadows. Now here are some photos I took out the front of my house. So uh, have a look at the shadows here. So this is with the reflector on, and this is with the reflector off. Crisp shadows are gonna be available again. That's something that's disappeared in the, in the panel light uh, phenomenon. Here's uh, just another video of me messing around out the front of my neighbor's house. So this is with the reflector on, so count my fingers. And this is with the reflector off. So see how crisp these shadows are. Fantastic for storytelling, fantastic for, for horror or anything like that. Now the other thing I've found that's disappeared in the last 10 years is texture. Now with a uh, small light source like this, you get really fine texture. So here's what I mean. I've got the light banging through my bedroom window and you can actually see the texture of the curtains in the shadows. The other thing I like about using the open face cob is the flood angle. It's basically 170 degrees or thereabouts. So to give you an example, here's the light uh, with the reflector on sitting in between my house and my neighbors. And here's the light with the reflector off. Now, in case you've been living under a rock and you don't know about uh, cob LED light engines or bow mount fixtures, one of the big sales pitches you constantly hear is um, you've got thousands of stills photography uh, units that can attach from soft boxes, beauty dishes, things like this, you know, really, really cheap. Here's the thing, when it comes to quality fixtures or quality attachments to stick on cob lights, stuff that's, that I would consider good enough to have uh, on a film set, it's a very limited amount. The vast majority of Bowens mount accessories are absolute rubbish. Uh, one thing I'm gonna say about this unit is um, in terms of mounting stuff to it, this unit is a bit different to um, a lot of the cheaper cobs that are out there. 
So what's different is the cob is actually mounted forwards or is actually positioned forwards of the mounting collar. Okay, so here you've got the mounting collar. Um, on a lot of cheaper lights, the cob or the light emitter is here. In this unit, it's actually sitting in the reflector where it should be. So you get a bit of distribution of light over your reflectors, things like that. It's not getting masked by the collar. So that's something to look out for if you're buying cobs. Um, now the other thing I like about this unit compared to a lot of other lights I've looked at is it actually does fit um, Bowen's S-mount stuff. So a lot of them are sort of like Bowen's mount, but the, um, the Bowen's S-mount stuff doesn't fit. So I just got a genuine Bowens here, and this is a legacy of the old cob I had about uh, six years ago. So I just stick this in. It's uh, no problem getting it on. Okay, so that's that's correctly mounted. Um, so the reason I have this unit is for because um, uh, it came with barn doors. That's the one thing that's very hard to find is a decent set of barn doors. Um, I think Aperture sells some, but. Um, a lot of barn doors you can buy online are basically four of these leaves and they don't, they don't cut the beam, they're absolute rubbish, which is why I bought this unit. Um, so as you can see there, the cob is sitting inside the reflector area, it's not sitting inside the collar. So that's an important thing to look for when you're buying a cob light. So let's start off the review by talking about the Forza 60 first. Um, what do you get for your money? Well, this is going to sell for 430 Australian dollars. So that sounds like a lot of money for a small light, but when you see how bright it is, um, you'll probably be thinking, hey, this is good value. So for your 430 bucks, you get the light engine, you get a 15 volt power supply, which is connected to the bottom of the stand, uh, you get the reflector, and you get a uh, handy little travel case. Um, it's actually quite a good bag. So uh, when I saw the bag and I saw the construction of the light, I can understand why Nang Guan uh, are doing a rebadge and a rename to Nang Light. Um, it is totally uh, different quality. It's a huge step up from what they used to sell. So anyway, let's uh, get back into talking about the light. All right, so one thing I want to point out first with the light is it's not actually a Bowens mount, this unit. Um, I'll just get the reflector off. Um, the reason it's not a Bowens mount is a Bowens mount quite literally wouldn't fit. So the Bowens mount is actually bigger than the light. Okay, so that's why it's a, a, smaller, a smaller mount system. Um, but having said that, this is, um, this is an incredibly efficient reflector, which we'll talk about in a sec. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is um, when you've got a light that is as small as this and is as powerful, it of course means you're going to have a cooling fan. So straight off the bat, let's uh, talk about what could be the only issue for people, and that's the cooling fan. So I'll shut up for a second and let you hear the fan. Now, um, I don't think it's really going to be an issue because you're not going to have your talent standing this close, but uh, quite possibly you could. Um, now, here's the interesting thing with this light. Without the reflector on, because I still haven't put the reflector on, it's got basically, I'm guessing, about uh, 160, 170 beam angle. So as you can see, one light is doing quite a good job of evenly lighting this wall, and that's about roughly one metre away. So if you were doing, say, uh, portraits uh, with a background or a green screen and you needed a small kit you could carry around, as you can see with the spread you get out of these, two of these would quite easily light a small background. Now, if for some reason you do have to operate the light really close to the microphones, you can turn the fan off, but it does come at a cost. When you turn the fan off, you lose 50% of your light level. So that is an option there if the fan is too loud. Now, it's just occurred to me that um, I haven't mentioned something that's a very important part of reviewing this, uh, this light and the other one. They're daylight balanced, okay? They're mono blocks. They're not bicolor or RGB. So I thought I'd better pop that in now before I forget. Okay, so in its current operating mode here where it's got no reflector on, basically, you know, a, a huge spread wash, um, this thing is coming in at uh, 365 lux, okay? so. That's my measurement at three meters here in my workshop. But just a quick disclaimer, if you're outside in, in, in the dark at night time, it might actually come in at less than that because in my workshop here, I have a white ceiling. So basically I, I might be getting a fair bit of bounce off the ceiling affecting my readings. So I can't guarantee that as an accurate reading. But anyway, 365 lux is what I was getting at three meters. Now to give you a comparison in terms of brightness, I had a look around my kit to find another light that was close to that. 
and the Dito Light DLED Turbo 7 in full flood running at 100% brightness uh, comes in at 361 lux. So in terms of brightness, uh, these are very, very similar in their current setups. Now, this comparison is just for brightness. This is, um, um, even though this light is nowhere near the, as bright as this unit once you put the reflector on, this unit has the most amazing optics. So, um, you yeah, know, this is worth the 3,000 bucks. I'm not slagging it off. Okay, so talking about uh, putting the reflector on, um, there is one difference uh, when you put the reflector on. And something I've got to mention here is I shouldn't be too critical at this point because this is the prototype. Um, they've uh, mentioned that to me a few times as a prototype reflector. But when you put the reflector on, it does change the Kelvin. So let's get the reflector on and have a look. So uh, without the reflector on, the light engine itself is actually very, very close to 5,600 Kelvin. It was coming in at 5,635, which is uh, very, very accurate. With the reflector on, it still comes in pretty close. It comes in at 5,877 Kelvin, which for me is still acceptable. I actually like my white lights a little bit bluer so they match into my HMIs. Uh, but again, um, that is um, possibly because this is the prototype reflector. Now, one problem I've had looking at this thing on social media um, is trying to get a gauge of the size of it. So to give you an accurate gauge of the size, everyone in the industry pretty much knows the Dito light. Okay, so about the size of a Dito light. Now the reflector, um, this reflector is incredibly efficient. So I just uh, pan it around to the camera and the difference between this and a lot of uh, mount dish um, sort of reflectors is you can see this is faceted. So basically it's got a whole stack of mirrors fashioned into it to try and punch uh, as much light forward as it can. So let's spin it around, turn it on. Now, uh, without the reflector on, it was a floodlight. So with the reflector on, it's, uh, I'd be guessing about 60 degrees. It feels like about 60 degrees to me, which is a good spread on a light, but hugely brighter. So without the reflector on, this thing was coming in at 365 lux at three meters. With the reflector on, it comes in at a staggering 1,210 lux. Now, I just want to point out that that's my measurement, not Nanlite's. Nanlite's measurement's actually a bit lower, but um, 1,210 lux sort of blew me away a bit. But then I thought, what what does that actually compare to? So I compared it against a 1K. So the 1K came in at 1,161 lux. So this is actually marginally brighter than a 1K tungsten. Okay, so let's have a look at the back of the unit. Um, the dimmer is really, really smooth, um, amazingly smooth. Now this unit does have effects, so um, like every light. So let's have a look, uh, we've got flash one. Okay, so basically it's flashing. Um, then they made the sequel, flash two. Okay, now my criticism of uh, flash two is it's not as, uh, as action paced as flash one. Um, then you've got uh, flash three. Okay, then uh, next um, is Storm. Okay, so that's meant to be lightning. Now, I think, uh, I think it's pulsing a bit too fast. I think a lot of um, um, uh, rolling shutter cameras will struggle with this. Um, you've got a second Storm, which I like. Now, the, what I like about having two Storm options is pretty much, say, the Ari Sky panel's only got the one. So you're watching low budget films and going, oh, they were using an Ari because it's the same pattern. Um, have we got another Storm? Yeah, we've got Storm 3. Uh, we've got TV, so basically it you know, adjusts its brightness like, like a TV. Okay, um, let's have a look. Uh, faulty globe or bad globe, so flickering fluorescent. I think it's a bit too, bit too fast. Um, that's just my opinion. I reckon cameras are going to struggle with that. Okay, and uh, the next one is my favourite effect of the lot, which is off. Okay, I think off is the best effect. Okay, the next thing down on the uh, menu is channel number. You've probably noticed this thing's too small to have DMX in. So basically, it runs off the Nanguan phone app. Uh, once I unlock my phone. Okay, I hate touchscreens. So manufacturers, please don't put touchscreens ever on lights. So it actually runs pretty good. So fantastic, you can run it off the phone app. The phone app is free, but here's the catch. You've got to buy a uh, a uh, dedicated uh, Wi-Fi controller box, that's about 500 bucks. So 430 bucks, 500 bucks, not worth it for this light, but if you've got a whole stack of lights, it might be worth it. I've got another video on this. Okay, uh, next in the menu, I think is fan on off. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward, pretty self-explanatory there. 
and I think that's it on the menu system. Now, other things on the back of the light, we also have the power inlet, which is 15 volts DC. Now, uh, one accessory they're gonna make for this is a little handhold, um, a little handle that, ha that takes two uh, of the Sony MPF batteries. Okay, so that's pretty cool. So that's a great idea. So this will run off Sony MPF. I would be assuming it can run off V-Lock. So I'd be assuming if you had a V-Lock and a, um, um, a D-Tap to whatever this connector is called, adapter, which I do have, that that would possibly run the light as well. Um, because this is the only one in Australia, I'm reluctant to give that a go, okay, in case I blow it up, because I have blown up lights doing this, because uh, even though this says 15 volts and V-Lock say on them 14.8, a fully charged high capacity V-Lock is actually closer to 17 volts. So uh, stay tuned, we'll find out if you can run um, this off of V-Lock. That'd be awesome if you could. All right, so let's wrap up talking about the 60 and get onto the 300. So um, this will be released in about four to six weeks. So that's about end, uh, mid to end July. Um, now at the point of release, I'm hearing that they won't have accessories ready for it. So it'll just be the basic kit. Now one accessory they're looking to make is a Fresnel. Now I'm just gonna quickly get onto a wish list of things that I, I would love this thing to have. So one thing I'd love is a set of clip-on barn doors, okay? Um, basically to control spill light. Um, the barn doors won't shape the light with this reflector, but the ability to control spill light would be awesome. The other thing too is, um, you know, you've got a really, this is a really professional schmick looking light, beautiful reflector, and then having gels gaffer taped to the front would look pretty ordinary. So having you know, the barn doors to clip to would, would really make a huge difference. All right, let's talk about the Forza 300. Okay, so um, this thing's gonna retail for about 1,599 Australian dollars. That's what they're hoping to sell it for. Um, it sounds like a lot of money, but it's actually not. This thing's really powerful. So for that money, you get the, uh, the light, you get the reflector, uh, you get all of the cabling, you get the control box, which looks like a podium, but it's not actually as big as it looks. Uh, you get a power supply unit and you get a uh, handy sort of carry bag for the whole lot. Now let's talk about the, uh, the control box because uh, this is a bit of an enigma at the moment uh, when it comes to social media. No one's really showing this thing. So the first thing that went through my mind when I first saw it was, you gotta be kidding, right? This thing's huge. You've got this small light and this massive control box, but it's actually not that big and I'll explain why it's not that big. So when I turn it around, you'll see it's actually quite clever. So basically it's hollow, okay? So uh, inside here are two V-lock mounts. And basically at the moment, this thing's hooked up to mains power. So it's got its power supply hooked in. So I just uh, disconnect the IC lead, uh, disconnect the Nutrix connector, and the power supply is V-lock mounted in. Okay, so this is an incredibly small lightweight power supply for what it's doing. A power supply this small means a cooling fan. Okay, so it is a little bit, uh, a little bit noisy. Uh, I don't necessarily think that's going to be a problem. Um, if you were, say, shooting on tiles and you had this thing going through a softbox and it was about, let's say, I reckon uh, less than a metre away, I reckon the combined noise of the cooling fans here and the cooling fan in this uh, could be a problem. So I'll just fire it all up. Bear in mind, I am uh, wearing a lapel mic and standing right in between them. So that wouldn't happen, but uh, here's the noise level. Now I've got to say, um, this thing's brighter than a 575 uh, HMI PAR. Um, uh, I would say the, the head here is actually quieter than uh, say an ARRI Pocket PAR 400 or an ARRI, a small ARRI HMI. And uh, this would be on a PAR with uh, the noise you get from a, a fan called Small Ballast. Now here's the genius of this. This is where I think uh, this is actually quite clever. Disconnect my uh, power supply, disconnect my Nutrix connector remove uh, the PSU, there we go. Now add my V-Lock batteries in. So these are just standard 14.8 uh, volt V-Locks. Um, they're 250 watt V-Locks. Now that will get me, um, these two batteries get me one hour and 20 minutes of runtime. I did that last night and that's at 100% brightness. Now it's pretty, pretty silent without the uh, power supply. So um, yeah, that's, that's a huge improvement. But here's what I like about this. So the batteries are inside the unit. So they're not gonna get knocked and bumped off when you're moving it around. 
The other thing I like is um, it's balanced, the weight. Okay, so that's your batteries, your controller, uh, all in one unit there. So when it comes to um, uh, ease of operation, if you're, if you're working outside, fantastic. Uh, the other thing too is the controls are on top. They're very easy to get to when this is on the ground. Um, it can also mount onto the stand, which uh, I'll talk about a bit later on. Um, but look, it's, it's definitely not as big as it looks. I've really got to say that. Now to get this uh, back into, from battery operation to mains power operation uh, isn't really that difficult. So basically turn it off, remove your batteries. Uh, the batteries are removed nice and easy. Okay, quite easily. The power supply goes on uh, very easy as well. Uh, in with your Nutrix connector, um, plug in your IEC lead and you're, you're back up and running uh, in mains power mode. So uh, very, very simple to switch between the two things. So uh, in comparison with say a HMI this size, you'd have, um, basically you'd have uh, two ballasts. You'd have an AC ballast and a, and a DC ballast. So this is actually not that bad. It's actually quite a compact little system. And when you do store it away, uh, when you do put it in its bag, uh, the, the cabling all fits into here. So it actually does efficiently use space when it's packed, which was my main concern when I first saw it. Okay, so let's talk about problems with the controller and things I don't like. Okay, so in terms of problems, I can only see one potential problem, and that is the uh, DMX out doesn't have any termination. So it doesn't auto terminate and doesn't have a manual termination. So if you need to stop your DMX signal at this point, you will need to put a termination socket in. Um, the next uh, limitation with this system is the length of connection that you can have between the control box and the head. Now I discovered this because I started asking questions about the head leads. So um, the head leads have the same connector at both ends. So that's to idiot proof it. So it doesn't matter which end you plug into here, which end you plug into there, it works perfectly fine. But the problem is you can't connect two cables together. So if you wanna get the light um, high up on a stand, you can't link two cables, okay? So you're gonna need a longer cable. So that's how this, conversa that's how this conversation started. So the longest head lead cable you can have is five meters, past five meters. This doesn't communicate to this without dropout. Now, the next thing I'm gonna talk about is these Nutrix uh, 48 volt connectors. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with these things. Now, what I hate about them is um, we already have a standard in the film industry for uh, 48 volt inlets, and that is um, three pin XLR. So if I wanna plug a battery into this unit, say an external big battery pack, I need to use a uh, Nutrix to XLR adapter. So it's another cable I've gotta carry. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the negative. Um, but uh, I said I have a love-hate. So the thing I love about these is when I'm renting them out, uh, somebody who has the Nutrix connector goes, well, that doesn't fit into there, that doesn't fit into there, okay, it must go into here. Now, when you've got a three-pin XLR, if you've rented the light to someone who suffers from an incurable mental condition known as stupidity, um, they will try to get it into one of the other outlets. And if it doesn't go in, they just use more force. Um, so basically, I've had so many connectors destroyed in rentals because people are connecting into the wrong outlets and trying to force them in when they don't connect. Now that absolutely cannot happen with these new tricks. So that is fantastic, but the thing I hate about it is as a gaffer, I end up carrying loads of adapter cables. So before we get into what's good about this, which is pretty much everything else, there is one slight improvement I'd do to it. And that would be to put rubber feet here, 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 and here. Uh, the reason I'd do that is if it started to rain and I was using this outdoors, I'd put it that way up on the ground and just chuck a rubber mat over it. Now let's talk about the one huge advantage this has over HMIs, particularly from a rental perspective, and that is one single power switch turns the whole system on and off. Okay, there's no separate power switch on the transformer. There's no separate switch on the head that uh, deactivates the switch at the controller. There's no micro switches anywhere. Just one switch on and off, really simple. Okay, so let's go through how to use the controller. So we're gonna really blow the budget here on gaffer and gear and go multicam. Okay, so uh, as you can see here, it's got a really beautiful, easy to use interface. Um, it's got two knobs. One knob basically is your dimmer control. Now with the dimmer control, it's not as accurate when you get down really low. So when I say really low, I mean under 5%. Uh, 
Um, look, basically, I think if you're, if you're operating a big light like this and under 5%, you uh, probably should be using a smaller light fixture anyway. So you can see here um, in the low end, uh, a bit jerky and not really super accurate, but again, 300 watts, you wanna run it at 1%, maybe you've got the wrong lamp out. So that's very easy to use. The other knob here is basically your menu selector. Um, really, really simple to use. So let's start having a play. So we've got an effects button. So we'll just press that and that gets you into your effects menu. Um, uh, the other button selects uh, your effect. So we've got all the flash uh, effects that we had on the 60. Uh, Storm. Now, um, here's the interesting thing with Storm. The next button along is Trigger. Okay, so if you press the trigger button, it fires. Okay, so that's really cool. So you can control uh, when the storm effect happens. Now, just talking about the storm effect, uh, what's really cool with this unit, um, if you run it with um, no dish on, you've got really super sharp shadows and a massive bean spread. So you can get the lightning effect through uh, multiple windows at the same time. It just, it looks really, really good. I've got to say, um, with all the LEDs I've looked at so far with the built-in storm effect, this one is easily the best. Okay, so let's keep going through the uh, menu system here. So that's Storm 1, we've got Storm 2, which is a different, uh, different effect. Uh, storm 3, uh, now Storm 3 uh, activates, it seems to activate without the trigger button. So that seems to be uh, uh, automatic. Uh, you've got a TV effect. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the TV effects on mono lights because it just, it doesn't look real unless you're doing a black and white TV. Um, and faulty globe. Now faulty globe I think flickers too fast, but, um, um, but they're basically the effects. Now uh, let's get out of the effects menu. Now one thing to note here is I'm running this off batteries and up in the top corner you've got the battery indicator. Now the battery indicator is actually more accurate than the battery indicators on the batteries, so uh, that's pretty reliable. Now uh, let's get into the menu system. The menu system is really easy to navigate, so let's just press the menu button. We've got, first thing we've got is screen rotate. So to select options, press the uh, selector. So you can turn the screen the other way up. Um, let's rotate the screen again. Okay, let's get out of here. Um, the next thing is DMX address. So as you'd expect, you can assign uh, between one and 512. Now the thing to note here um, with the DMX, it's not just the uh, DMX input that you're selecting with that channel selector. You're also selecting uh, the Wi-Fi input because you can run this uh, unit off the LEDGO uh, Wi-Fi controller. Uh, this is a, a separate piece you've got to buy. Now, I've got a whole other video on this. I would suggest watching that video before you buy this. Now, let's uh, continue on through the menu system. So at any point you want to go back, uh, you just press the menu and it goes back to the main menu. Fan on and off. Okay, so you can turn the fan off to get rid of the noise, but of course you lose 50% of your light level. But it looks a uh, real simple uh, system to navigate. Um, Screen brightness, so you can adjust your screen brightness, uh, whether the backlight buttons are on. Um, basically, that's about it. Now, one thing I do like with this is, uh, let's go back out of the menu system. Uh, you've got a keypad lock. Okay, so press the keypad lock, um, nothing, uh, nothing activates. Now, what you can't see on here, because um, my phone camera is pretty crap, is that uh, when you press a button, it glows um, a slight blue. So you can see that the keypad locks on. So look, this thing's really simple to use, really straightforward, love it. Now let's talk about the light. Um, the first thing that strikes me is um, it's all metal. Um, literally the handles are metal, the back's metal, the sides, tops and bottoms are metal, that's metal, the Bowen's mount's metal, um, even the little lock-off handles here, they're metal. Um, they haven't cut any corners, this is, this is not Nanguan quality. This is definitely worth uh, a brand rebadge. It is solid as. Now, in terms of the light itself, um, this section is pretty much the light and the rest is thermal management. So basically a big heat sink and a big fan underneath to dissipate the heat. So I just want to talk very, very quickly uh, about the, th uh, the thermal dynamics of this unit. They seem to have got it right. Now I've owned, I think, six cob lights, probably even more than that including Fresnel's. And one of the problems I've found with cob lights um, is if you're running them for extended periods of time, say like you know, uh, six, seven, eight hours, some of them tend to go green because uh, the cob, the actual uh, lead itself, starts overheating. That's not the case with this unit. I've run this for a solid eight hours and run the spectrometer over it and there is no DUV variation. Now, it wouldn't be a gaffering gear video unless I talked about the lock-offs. 
This is just my personal preference. I don't like the lock-offs. So at the moment they're unlocked and uh, the unit has notches, okay? So you can um, put it into position and it stays there. So I reckon some of you will love that, particularly if you're using big modifiers, you know the unit's not gonna slip at any point. But uh, for me, I personally find it irritating. I always find that, you know, um, I don't want it there, I don't want it there, I want it in between. Um, so my plan was uh, when I was looking to buy these, I was still looking to buy them, was to basically file down the notches and then put some clutches in there to, so, I can, so I can get fine tuned angles. But given the amount of steel that's in this or the amount of alloy that's in this, I don't think I'll be able to file them back. So I'm just gonna have to embrace it, I think. But that's just my personal preference. I'd rather it didn't, but I can see why they've done it. And I, I think with people who are, are using big soft boxes, um, that will be a big advantage to you. All right, so from a gaffer's point of view, what is it about this that I um, that I really like over other cobs? What what is it about this that's got me, you know, considering buying these and using them as replacements to HMI? So over other cobs that are currently on the market, um, well, quite simply, its size and its weight. Okay, so how heavy is it? Well, I haven't actually weighed it, and I don't have time because I've got to get this. Um, this is getting picked up very soon. Um, it is literally small finger heavy, okay? So I don't know what that is in kilograms, but uh, I'm not the strongest bloke in the world and I can hold that with my small finger. So it, it's very, very lightweight. And the other thing is the size. Um, now, in order to get it down to this size, of course, um, they've had to put a fan in. Um, but uh, what I like about this compared to passively cooled, passively cooled things are huge. And um, a passively cooled 300 or 400 watt um, cob would be around the 12 kilogram mark, just to give you an idea. Um, uh, the other thing I like about this too is it's not long, okay? So uh, there are other units that are longer. Now those longer units will run quieter, okay? So I'm not, I'm not canning them. If that is a consideration for you, if you, and if you need absolutely whisper quiet, then you're gonna, probably gonna want a, a longer unit. But for me, uh, this, this size unit is just fantastic. I can have this, uh, say, on top of a cupboard on, on a turtle base and the back's not gonna hit the wall. You know, it'll, it'll fit in small spaces. Um, I could have this, uh, because of its weight and size, um, I could have this on a menace arm going out over a, uh, over a dining table, for example, um, rigged up pointing down and I can get this right up to the ceiling because it's short um, and have a Bowen's mount china ball on the front. So, yeah, that's not outside of the realms of impossibility. It's, it's very, very doable because of the weight and size. So I think uh, from a gaffer's point of view, um, they've just nailed the size. It is absolutely perfect and the weight is absolutely perfect. Okay, so what a lot of you probably just really wanna know is how bright is this unit? Okay, so uh, without a reflector on, so bare cob. So basically the, um, the minimum amount of light you're gonna get out of it at 100% brightness uh, this thing comes in at 1,750 lux at three meters. Okay, so uh, 1,750 lux at three meters. What does that compare to? Well, I did a shootout with this and a uh, 575 HMI Fresnel, and the 575 HMI Fresnel came in at 1,640 lux. So this unit with no reflector on it actually outpunches a HMI Fresnel in, uh, in, in flood. Now, here's a thing to consider if, if you're a gaffer. Okay, the, the HMI Fresnel does have the advantage that it flood spots, okay? Um, but uh, with this unit, if you got, say, a, a Bowen's mount black dish with some barn doors on it, um, you would get uh, better shadow renditions because you've got a, a single light source and you get better barn door cuts than you'd get out of your Fresnel. So that's really something to consider. Okay, so let's talk about this, uh, this thing with the reflector on. Now, to give you some idea of size, um, this is a Ari Pocket Par 400, okay? So it's uh, from uh, nose to tail, it is uh, about the same size. All right, okay, so with the reflector on, uh, this thing jumps almost to three times brightness. Uh, so it comes in at uh, 5,040 lux at three meters. So how bright is that relatively speaking? Well, uh, in a shootout with the uh, Ari Pocket Par 400, the Ari Pocket Par 400 came in at 3,550 lux. Now I just want to point out something here. 
The Arupokapa um, at 3,550 lux, that was with no lens, okay? So it was flooded out fairly even, uh, but no lens. So um, basically uh, doing the comparison with the, the maximum, uh, maximum amount of light I could pump out of the pocket par without putting a lens in. So um, that's, um, that's staggering. Now, um, the other thing too, uh, this thing uh, is coming in at uh, 98 TLCI, and the color vector testing, the TM30, uh, reveals that a more realistic score would be uh, about uh, 91. So let's just put that into some perspective here. So uh, 91, um, a 91 TM30 color vector score doesn't sound that high. Uh, anything above 90 is really good but let's do some perspective. So let's compare that to the color render you get off a small HMI because a lot of people think HMIs are extremely high color render and that is true with 1.2 Ks and above, but below 1.2 Ks, um, they perform pretty poorly. So uh, the globe in this, which is a fairly new globe, was giving us a TLCI score of 78. Color vector testing revealed that uh, a more realistic score would be 87. So not only was um, the LED uh, brighter, but it outperforms the smaller HMIs in terms of color rendition. Now in the intro, I said that this is brighter than a 575 HMI par. So uh, I got a 575 HMI par, matched the beam angle up, uh, comparing this to the unit with the reflector, matched the beam angle up with a medium, uh, medium flood lens. So I didn't use the most diffused lens, I used the third lens out of the five. Um, and the uh, HMI par came in at 3,480 lux. Okay, so um, this does in flood outperform uh, with its reflector on, does outperform a 575 uh, HMI par. And again, outperforms it in terms of, um, of uh, color rendering. But the thing I've got to point out here, because someone's going to keyboard warrior and, and make comments, the HMI pars uh, are fantastic for spot. And I've got to say, it wouldn't matter what a, a spot attachment you put on this, whether you had the Fresnel attachment, whatever, um, the HMI pars will definitely outspot this thing. So to give you an idea, um, my 575 HMI par that I compared to with this in full spot actually comes to 15,000 lux. So, um, you know, don't necessarily chuck your pars in the bin yet. If you're, if you're working in spot a lot, um, they're gonna outspot these things. But if you're not working in spot a lot, if you're predominantly flood, I think the writing's on the wall. All right, so one very uh, quick tip I've got for uh, Nanlite is um, what would really take this from uh, amateur to pro is um, having some barn doors that mount onto the front of this, some decent sized barn doors that can uh, cut any spill light. That would be really, really awesome. Okay, so now I'm getting really under pressure to wrap up this review because this light's got to travel. Um, all right, uh, one thing I really love about the controller and whoever it was at Nanguan that did this, Thank you very much. You don't know how much I love you. Okay, when you turn this thing on and it's set to 100% brightness, it doesn't go thump, okay? It slowly fades up. And uh, so just watch that. So it slowly comes up to full power. It doesn't just go bang. And that's really important for protecting your batteries. Um, uh, it makes a huge difference, particularly as your batteries get older, you won't get false tripping on them. So whoever did that, thank you very much. I really do appreciate that. Uh, the other thing uh, that's sort of elegant about this is the way it mounts to the stands. Um, I really do like that. That's very, very simple. However, I feel sorry for whoever designed the clamp. It is the most elegant and beautiful designed clamp um, I've ever seen. It really is a work of art, but here's the problem with it. It only fits the top columns. It doesn't fit uh, the lower columns on the stands. So. If you're, using the, um, if you're using the light high up, you can't uh, mount the controller um, onto a stand using that clamp. But uh, it's not a total waste. Um, the actual mount part for the controller is just screwed in, so you can unscrew this and then connect it to a super clamp. Um, so I will be, uh, it will be getting used in some form, um, but it's just a real shame because it really is beautiful and elegant. All right, let's start off the technical reviews by looking at the Forza 60 with its reflector off. So its CCT comes in at 5,635 Kelvin. Its DUV, which is its variation from white, comes in at four increments. 
which is ever so slightly green, but incredibly close to white. Its TLCI score comes in at a very respectable 98. However, TM30 color vector testing reveals a more accurate score would be 92% color rendition with a 100% saturation. Now let's have a look at the individual CRI scores. They are all above 95 with one exception, which is R12. And here is the spectrum graph. All right, so let's have a look at the Forza 60 with the reflector on, and there is quite a bit of difference. The CCT is higher. It comes in at 5,877 Kelvin. The DUV, which is how accurate whites are, is smack on the Planckian curve. The TLCI is a very healthy 98. However, TM30 color spectrum analysis indicates a more realistic score would be 91% color rendition with a saturation of 100%. Here are the individual CRI scores, and note there are some differences with the reflector on. We now have several scores below 95. And here is the color spectrum analysis. Now let's have a look at the results for the Forza 300 with the reflector off. The CCT comes in at 5,663 Kelvin. The DUV comes in at 19 increments above the Planckian curve, so it is slightly green. Now this correction is under a 1 8 correction, so if you corrected it with a magenta, it would end up slightly pink. The TLCI comes in at a very respectable 98%. However, TM30 color vector testing indicates a more realistic score would be 91% with an average of 99% saturation. Here are the individual CRI scores, and with the exception of R12 at 74%, all of the other scores are above 95. And here is the color spectrum analysis. Now I'm not gonna bother showing you the results with the reflector on, because they're pretty much identical. But here are the results for the unit when it's CTO corrected, or basically changed from daylight to tungsten using a gel. The unit comes in at 2869 Kelvin. Its DUV is minus 11 increments, which means that it is ever so slightly pink, about a 1 16th correction gel out. Its TLCI score is a very healthy 97. What is surprising is the TM30 color analysis. As you can see by the graphics, it is insanely accurate. Its color rendition score is a 94% average with a 101% saturation average. What is surprising is the wavelength analysis. It actually does look like a real tungsten balanced LED. I'm Andrew Locke, see you on the next episode of Gaffering Gear.